that point in time, we will get to see our mission at work. So one of my favorite things to do when I was a kid in church was to go on mission trips. Have you ever been on a mission trip before? There's so much fun. There's so much fun. And uh, I went on my first mission trip when I was in sixth grade. And we went to the little town of Effingham, Illinois. And uh, I was on a crew with about, I don't know, five or six other people. My best friend was with me. And um, our job mission, should we choose, chosen to have accepted it, was to paint a house. And so we had a whole week just dedicated to repainting this garage. Now, as a sixth grader, I really didn't know what was happening. I was still young. I didn't really know God. I didn't really understand what was happening at that moment. All I knew was that it was really, really hot. Girls were on my crew. And I got to paint with my buddy. And that was it. Now, I knew that I loved to serve people. I knew that I loved working with my hands, and I knew that I loved painting that house. So for the extended period of time until I was 22 years old, every single summer, I went to at least one mission trip. I tried to make it to two. Sometimes I made it to three, but I was a really busy kid in the summer and normally made it to two. And then when I hit 22 years old, I decided that I should serve in the ministry. And so I never stopped mission work. I just continued to serve. I just got paid to do it. So every year when we went to each town, it always meant something different. We went everywhere. We went to West Virginia, to Georgia. We went to, to Mississippi, uh, Tennessee. We went to all kinds of interesting different places. We went to Greensburg, Kansas, the, the most interesting one that I've ever been to. Um, I got to see the aftermath of an F5 tornado. Greensburg, Kansas was completely flat, and we got the opportunity to go into this person's house and drywall and remodel their entire basement because they had nothing. Their whole house was completely down. Uh, we got done, and we had extra money to give, and we gave them the extra money, and they just broke down in tears. And they say, you have no idea how much that means to us. And we didn't. We, we didn't know. All we knew is that we loved God, and we loved serving other people. And that was it. And we wanted to give everything that we could to do that. So as all of these things happened, I didn't realize that God was training me for service. From sixth grade till I was about 22, he was training me for service to do it full time until finally God said, okay, I think you're equipped enough. I, don't, I would disagree with God, but he's God, so we don't disagree with him, right? And he said, I'm going to throw you in a ministry, and there you go. You, you have been equipped for service. So as, as I got into ministry, as I started all of these things, um, I noticed that I was really, my, one of my spiritual gifts that I really love uh, is in my life is compassion. I'm a very compassionate person. I love to serve people. I probably serve people more than I ought to because I don't care enough about me and I love to give the rest I love to give the rest to other people to just do anything that I can. And, and I, I, I'm so compassionate that I believe that's why he called me into ministry. Because I, I care for people, I serve people, I protect people, I do whatever it takes to protect you. And I love you. All the time. And I'm going to do whatever it takes short of sin to make our family bigger. And to bring more people in because I am compassionate about here, about this town, about this community. So, what do you think we're going to talk about today? We are going to talk about missions in the church, because we have to rethink our church, right? 
We are rethinking the way that we do church, but let me tell you something. This church has never skipped a beat when it comes to missions and outreach. So today, I want to encourage you, because all of this stuff that we're going to talk about today, we already do, and we're going to talk about it. And I am so proud that we do all of these things. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. Now, Matthew chapter 25 is a very, very famous verse. Lots of people have preached it. Lots of people have talked about it. It's very straightforward. It's very easy. But sometimes we don't always take what's happening within this Bible verse very seriously. And so today we're going to break it down. We're going to look at it. We're going to discuss it. So we're going to be in chapter 25. We're going to be in verse 31. Jesus is talking here. These are red letters, but they're not red up there. He says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory with all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on on his left. Now we got to stop there because before I kind of read it this week, I, I had, I couldn't imagine the moment. So imagine this moment for me for just a minute, for just a second. Imagine Jesus is coming to us from heaven. He is making his appearance on earth. This is the second coming of Christ. He is going to be seated on the throne, the heavenly throne. Jesus Christ, all right, is going to be seated on the heavenly throne with all of the angels. How many angels are up in heaven right now? Revelation chapter 4, right? There are millions upon millions of angels up in, up in heaven. How many does he say he's going to bring? All of them. Millions of angels will be seated around this throne. Angels everywhere, all over the place. And then he says, I want everybody else, all of the humans, right, to come before me. Can you imagine that? All the nations, all the tribes, communities, townships, everywhere throughout the earth, all people standing in front of this throne with Jesus Christ seated, millions of angels all around. It gives me goosebumps thinking about that very moment. And here's what he says. He will be seated on his throne. We will be gathered together. And he said, I'm going to start separating you guys. And that's scary. Because at that point in time, we will get to see our mission at work. Whether or not we brought people to the kingdom of heaven. And so as we're standing, Jesus is going to say, you're a sheep, you're a sheep, you're a sheep, you're a goat. You're a sheep, you're a goat, you're a goat, you're a goat, you're a goat, you're a goat. You're a sheep, sheep, goat, goat, and he'll separate everybody one by one until we're split. There should not be a split, right? Everybody should be able to go to heaven, but we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? Now we can get into the verse that we always read, okay? Verse 34. So now you see the situation. Here it's laid out. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. So all the sheep at this point in time get to receive the inheritance. The inheritance is the kingdom of heaven. They get to go on to live in glory with all of the angels, with Jesus seated on the throne. This whole situation that was right here is going to be in heaven for eternity. 
and we get to worship and praise and glorify God the entire time. Now, here's the situation, and here's the thought that I had. So if Jesus walked into our church right now, in the middle of this sermon, during all the stuff that's happening right now, everything would stop, right? It, it wouldn't matter if we were eating weenies and chili afterwards. No way, not if Jesus is here. All our plans, all our schedules, all our appointments, none of it, none of it would matter anymore. We would drop everything. And if he needed anything, anything at all, who would be the first one to get it for him? Nobody? I would get Jesus something. You kidding me? Heck yeah, it's Jesus Christ. I would be the first one to run up and say, do you need anything? That's what Jesus was talking about in the verses we just read. To the least of these, right? Jesus tells us to help those who need him the way that we would help him if he were here right this very minute. You with me so far? All right. Verse 37. So he tells all of these things, hungry, thirsty, naked, need clothes, all that stuff, right? Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? We never saw, they said, we never saw you, Jesus. You never came down except for this moment right here where, where you came. And then Jesus replies, he says, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So I had to pause here for a minute because this is the point in the passage where it sounds like our faith is a work-based faith, doesn't it? You have to earn your way to heaven. He says, if you do all of these things, if you clothe people, if you feed people, if you give to people, if you do all, on and on and on and on and on, then I will give you your inheritance. you got to read it again, though. I had to ask myself, though, while I was reading this, why I did all those mission trips. Why was I serving people? Why was I giving to those in need? Why did I get into ministry? Why do I have this gift of compassion where I just love serving people? Am I doing it for myself? Am I trying to earn my way to heaven by being a pastor? Read it again. Verse 37, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? There's the word. When did we see you hungry? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you sick? When did we see you in prison? The, the word that stands out in that phrase is when. Because they didn't know that they were serving God. Do you know why they were serving God? It was the condition of their heart. The servant-minded person loves and accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and then goes on to serve others, not because they have to, but because they want to serve. Are you with me? They want to serve Jesus. And so by these people saying, well, when did we see you do all of, where were you? you? You weren't the guy on the street that I just gave clothes to. You weren't the guy in prison that I prayed for. You weren't the guy that needed food or anything like that. You, that was not Jesus. And Jesus said, yes, it was. It was completely me because when you serve the least of these, you did it for me. Not because you had to, but because you wanted to. They had compassion for other people. They kept asking this question. You know, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, it talks about how we're saved by grace through faith. Grace is not works, right? 
Faith is believing in something we can't see in Hebrews, right? So if we have faith that things are going to happen, we get the grace of all of the stuff that Jesus has said, and we do the things out of love for each other, not because we have to. These sheep, they did what they did because they believed in an unseen God, and that was it. This was amazing. Verse 41, so then he will say to those on his left, he'll say, depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I said that fast because it's scary. All right, it's scary and sad. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer. Look at the same question they answered from the same question that the sheep questioned. I don't know if that made sense. It made sense in my head and then I said it and it sounded really weird. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? It's the same question from the verse above, right? Well, when did we, we didn't see you either. So why are we getting punished? He will reply, verse 45. Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. They did not believe in the saving power of Jesus Christ, so they fended for themselves. They didn't have compassion on people. They didn't love each other. They did things out of all of the sin in the world, and they did not serve Jesus. So he says, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the, but the righteous to eternal life. Where do the goats go? The goats go to eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why is it important for us to be on mission? We don't want to see a lot of people go to the fire. Amen? We want to take people with us to heaven, to the glorious realm, to the angels, to Jesus Christ seated on the throne. I don't ever want to see anybody into eternal damnation, to be on fire the entire time. Whatever hell looks like, it looks like a really bad place. And I don't want you to go there. I don't want to go there. I believe in Jesus Christ. You must believe in Jesus Christ. We don't say it enough. It's an important, relevant question to ask every single person around you. Do you know how to ask it? I'll tell you. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Awkward is awesome. Be awkward. The American ideal life is a selfish one. But when we see the life-changing effects of God's grace, how could we keep it to ourselves? How could we not sacrifice to ourselves and show Jesus to those in need. Caring for the poor and needy is more practical than we, than we think, and it takes more than positive words to keep others out. Here's James chapter two in verse 14. It says this. It says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone has to claim faith but has no deeds? The reason why we do the deeds is so we can show the faith, right? We can't, we can't teach people about the good news of Jesus Christ if we don't do anything. So in fact, I guess, this is God's version of saying, hey, get out and do something. Go tell people. We gotta get people to heaven. Can faith save them? Verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, this is James. This is the brother of Jesus quoting his brother, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? 
We must get out and serve others. But can I tell you something? You guys do a fantastic job at our church serving our community. You guys do a great job serving our community. We pray for, a, we pray for our community on a regular basis. We encourage our community on a regular basis. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We must continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus. How do I know that we are still on mission? Well, this past month, we've been doing this thing called Coats for Kids. We talked about it this morning, and we had to call the Knights of Columbus guy to come and pick up the coats because they were overflowing and on the floor everywhere, and I didn't want them to get trampled on. It was that many coats on the floor. He came in, and, and, and he came into the office area, and I was just chit-chatting with him, walking down the, the hallway here, and I got around, we got around the corner, and he turned the corner, and he said, oh my goodness. And I said, what? And he said, you have that many coats? And I said, yeah. I said, we try and do what we can to help the kids. I mean, kids need coats. It's going to get cold. It's cold today. <laughs> he said, there is not a single church in Riverton that has given that many coats. In two months, in December, we do this thing called Christmas baskets. And before COVID hit, we were able to give food to over, and I don't know the exact amount, but to over 20 families in our community, we only serve our community with this, who needed it. And let me tell you, I think we stretched the receipt out and it made it all the way across the stage. It was unbelievable the amount of food that we were able to give people in December. Unbelievable. And it was so much fun. And each one of us would go to the house and we would give them all this food, uh, all this food. Oh my goodness. And they would tell us and say, they would say, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us this food. We really appreciate it. And every time I would tell them, this food is not from me. It's from God. Who else could have given that much stuff to you? Not me. I can't do it without God. I can't do anything without God. And so we need to continue to teach everybody in our community that we are on mission to serve you. Not because we have to, but because we want to. We have compassion for you, and we genuinely love and appreciate each and every person in this community. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you believe in. We hope someday that you'll believe in Jesus Christ, but that is the point of service. That is the point of being on mission. And so I want to say thank you so much for giving back to our community because they see it. He saw it when he came and picked up the coats, and he's a Christian. What do you think all the kids see when they get a brand new coat for winter? 70-some kids, I don't know. 70-some kids in the community gets a new coat. Wow. And so that is why Jesus said this. You are serving me because I was hungry. Verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. See the difference in tone when we read it? I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look after me. And I was in prison and you came to me. You see, we don't have to do these things. We want to because we're on mission for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you continue to light a fire in our hearts to continue to serve our community, to continue to bring things to our community so that they can see you in our face every single day. 
And I pray, Father, that we can continue to encourage one another to show compassion for our community as we serve everyone around us. Father, I ask that you continue to give us the resources needed to accomplish the tasks at hand so that we can better give back to our community. We never want to save. We do just want to give. Give it all to our community so that we might show your love and compassion to them. Father, give us courage to do these things because we all know sometimes it can be hard to give what is earned from us away. And I pray, Father, that we can do it boldly, that we can do it with a servant's heart, and that we can do it out of the love and compassion for you inside of us. Father, we love you so much. And it's in your wonderful, most holy, powerful name that we pray these things. Amen.